Hello again. I'm still Doctor Strange. My middle name is still Stephen. My dad still chose the name. There you go. If you weren't here on Tuesday, then you won't know what that means, but that's fine. Now, we're going to do some uh, hard work this morning. It's a great privilege to be giving these uh, page lectures. And uh, again, greetings uh, from the UK. Uh, thank you once again for the partnership that we have with um, uh, Southeastern, with Crosslands. So I'm the director of Crosslands Forum. And it's been a great honor to do some teaching here this year uh, as well. Um, you've looked after me incredibly well this, this week. I was saying to Dr. Aiken, I've had my year's supply of um, hamburgers, and uh, you do food so much better than we do. I have to say that. Okay. In the 2010 introduction to the second edition of his book, Uncommon Decency, Christian Civility in an Uncivil World, Richard Mao, some of you may have heard of him, you could say evangelicalism's preeminent civility campaigner, speaks of how people had been telling him that a revised edition of the book had been needed now more than ever. That's in 2010. Now, remember the first edition of the book in 1992 opens with Richard Mao quoting the Irish poet W.B. Yeats from his poem, The Second Coming. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. I repeat, that's what Mao quotes in 1992. If things were falling apart in 1992, and they needed to be um, kind of refreshed in 2010, well, I think you know where this is going. Whether it's politics, national or ecclesiastical, protests or pandemics, these last few years could well be called years of incivility with fragmentation and fracturing exacerbated by the phenomena of cyber balkanization and what people call the splinter net. Now, there's a new study that's come out that you'll be interested by um, involving 7,000 US participants. And the study is called Differential Personality Change Earlier and Later in the Coronavirus Pandemic in a longitudinal sample of adults in the United States. Catchy title. And this has looked at the impact of the pandemic on five personality traits. Extroversion versus introversion, agreeableness versus antagonism, conscientiousness versus lack of direction, neuroticism versus emotional stability, and openness versus closeness to experience. And the results of the study, which you can go to, are sobering, showing that the pandemic appears to have negatively affected the following areas. Our ability to express sympathy and kindness towards others, agreeableness. Our capacity to be open to new concepts and willing to engage in novel situations, openness. Our tendency to seek out and enjoy other people's company, that's been negatively affected, what you might call extroversion. And then finally, our desire to strive towards our goals, to do tasks well, or to take responsibilities towards others seriously, conscientiousness. To repeat, all of those have been affected by coronavirus. In an already tense situation. Now look, you know, your churches face similar issues to our churches. Your country faces similar issues to my country. The temptation to talk past each other, to caricature each other, to just talk in kind of echo chambers is strong. We feel squeezed, squeezed of the time needed for reason debate where we can discuss things properly and squeezed of a space for fear of being threatened 
abused and cancelled. That we're fearful is part of the vicious cycle. Now, I believe the case for Christian civility is a strong one. And you might say it's obvious. I know in recent weeks even, there's been some pushback on whether being winsome is a good thing or not. I happen to think it is a good thing. Richard Mao defines civility as that we display tact, moderation, refinement, and good manners toward people who are different from us. Such displays are not merely external and superficial, but have an inner heartfelt commitment to those God identifies as our neighbors, however different they are from us. Uh, borrowing from Martin Marty, and I know that um, David Dockery has used this expression as well, Mao contends that we need a convicted civility which combines a civil outlook with passionate intensity. Being civil does not mean that we don't have convictions or can be passionate, um, passionate about things. Mao's theological tool for civility comes from his reformed heritage and primarily the doctrine of common grace, a doctrine which he's returned to again and again. Tim Keller argues that it's the gospel that produces the virtues of humility, tolerance, patience, and courage needed for Christian civility. Why? The gospel removes pride, the greatest barrier to a clear exchange of ideas. It gives us humility. The gospel removes cynicism and pessimism. Now, notwithstanding some differences that I might have with Mao or Tim Keller, I've benefited greatly from their work. And in their passionate pleas for this convicted civility in the public square. Now, what I want to give you this morning is not a caution, nor is it a caveat, but rather a compliment to their work. And given the nature of this particular seminary, I know that you'll be very pleased to know that my contribution draws from the deep well of mission and missiology. For a moment, allow me to be very English. Not that trait of feeling obliged to apologize yourself for someone else's mistake, a very English thing to do, or being so communicatively indirect that you have no idea what I'm talking about. I've experienced that a few times this week. No, let me be English by quoting from John Stott in his 1975 book, Christian Mission in the Modern World. The very concept of electics is out of accord with the diffident, tolerant mood of today. But no Christian who accepts the biblical view of the evil of idolatry on the one hand and the finality of Jesus Christ on the other can escape it. Further, only those who see the need for elenctics can also see the need for dialogue and can understand its proper place. I want to suggest that the framing for our Christian civility is a passionate intensity that is not only convicted but Elenctic in its shape. And you're thinking, what's elenctics? Elenctics derives from the Greek elengo. It's a word that appears seven or eight times in the New Testament. And it means to convict or unmask or bring to shame. It's a neglected theological term. Indeed, it's an entire lost theological discipline, because in the history of theological education, especially in the 19th century, there were departments of electics. You might call it missionary apologetics, but I like electics. J.H. Bavinck, the, the nephew of Herman Bavinck, my great hero, who I'll come on to shortly, defines electics as the science which is concerned 
with the conviction of sin. It's the science which unmasks to heathendom all false religions as sin against God, and it calls heathendom to a knowledge of the only true God. Now, Lenctics has a missiological drive because it's not primarily concerned with an on-the-back-foot defense of the faith, but it goes on the offensive, attacking unbelief. Alenctics calls non-Christian religions to a position of responsibility and attempts to convince their adherents of sin and to move them from repentance and conversion. Now, you might be thinking, how is he going to do this? Because it, given that definition of alenctics, you wouldn't think that alenctics and civility would make a happy marriage. The alenctic stress captures the biblical mood of war even, of antithesis, of confrontation and difference. Civility, the stress is on peace and commonness and common grace and common createdness and a common arena. However, both alenctics and civility go together. And I want to uh, uh, argue, really, in this, uh, in this particular uh, lecture, that we need both. In other words, our elenctics needs to be civil, and our civility needs to be elenctic. There is a peacefulness in our warring, and a warring in our peacefulness. And so in what follows... I'm going to describe in more detail the discipline of elenctics before, at the end of the lecture, talking about what I'm going to call a civil elenctics, focusing on the church and the seminary. And in my second lecture this evening, which I'm sure you'll all want to come back to, I'm going to focus on an elenctic civility which focus on, focuses on cultural apologetics and how we engage the culture in the public square. So this morning, church and seminary, this afternoon, the public square. Okay. Let's give a foundation for uh, Alenctics. Overshadowed by his more famous uncle, Herman, J.H. Bavinck, 1895 to 1964, is arguably the most important and influential 20th century missiologist in the Dutch and English-speaking neo-Calvinist traditions. Edmund Clowney, the famous um, uh, Bible studies, biblical theology lecturer at Westminster, stated that J.H. Bavinck's textbook, An Introduction to the Science of Missions, was not merely a text on missions, it was the text on missions of this generation. And what's interesting, I think, is Clowney um, and Bav Bavinck were very influential on the missiologist Harvey Conn, who was very influential on the ministry of Tim Keller. I think there's a direct line there, and um, it's important to note that. So, this book, The Introduction to the Science of Missions by J.H. Bavinck, would have been the textbook that Keller used at Gordon Conwell, and may even be, have been um, circulated in Southern Baptist circles as well. Bavinck was a champion for the discipline of missiology as its own distinct division within theology. Listen to this, and I know that you will say a big amen to this in your heads, maybe, if not out loud. Missions is not simply a byproduct of ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical life and theology. Missions belongs to the very essence of the church and therefore always pushes itself to the fore of all theological reflection. Amen? Good. Bavinck's introduction to the science of missions is precisely that, since it enables us to emphasize our preoccupation with every aspect of missions, of which the church is its object. And Bavinck talks about the science of missions in two parts, the theory of missions and the history of missions. Now, having surveyed the biblical material, Bavinck distills mission as, and I quote, that activity of the church, in essence, it is nothing else than an activity of Christ exercised through the church, through which the church in this interim period 
in which the end is postponed calls people of the earth to repentance and to faith in Christ so that they may be made his disciples and through baptism be incorporated into the fellowship of those who await the coming of the kingdom. Now, the only tweak I'd make there is that, for me, that's believer's baptism. In terms of the aim and purpose of mission, Bavinck follows the grandfather of reform missiology, Virtus, who speaks of the three aims of mission, the conversion of the nations, the planting of the church, and the glorification and the manifestation of divine grace. What Bavinck says, though, is that these three things are interdependent on a single purpose, the coming and the extension of the kingdom of God. These are not three separate purposes, but one great final and exalted purpose that is disclosed to us in three blessings, of which the glorification of God is undoubtedly foremost, the establishment of the church second, and the conversion of the heathen third. Look, let me just pause there. This is so important because I think even today we struggle with, is missions about glorifying God? Is it about building believers? Or is it about evangelism? It's all of them, and they all are perspectives of each other. Now, whilst championing, championing the discipline of missiology, Bavinck also recognizes that the object of missionary science is too linked to other subdivisions of theology for it to be isolated. Theology is a living organism and not a hodgepodge of separate studies. Now, this is a helpful comment for it explains Bavinck's disciplinary, I suppose, filling of what he puts between the theory of missions and the history of missions, which is this thing he calls elenctics. The ascertainment of a view of non-Christian religions which is responsible from the biblical point of view. Such a study is so indispensable for a proper view of non-Christian religions that missionary science cannot possibly do without it. For a theory of missions is incomplete unless it can properly evaluate non-Christian religions. Now, ironically, a weakness in Bavinck's introduction is that he doesn't really do that work. So um, we have to kind of do a little bit of that for him. So, number one, the foundations of elenctics, a subversive fulfillment of a theology of religions. In my previous work, I've attempted to construct what I call a subversive fulfillment model of other religions. A subversive fulfillment theology of religions contends that the category of idolatry is the most accurate container in explaining the complexity of human religiosity, allowing both for discontinuity between Christian faith and other religions, Hence, Jesus Christ both subverts and fulfills them simultaneously. And I'll be, if you come this evening, I'll give a, another explanation of this, looking at 1 Corinthians 1. Bavinck's theology of religions, how he interprets other religions, is, I think, none other than a faithful, creative reformulation of Calvin's notion that there is a sense of the divine, that there's a seed of religion in all people, and that what we do in our sin is what Calvin calls create a factory of idols. The raw material out of which religion is fashioned is divine revelation and our response to it. And in two places in his work, and if you want to turn to it, you can do, Bavinck does a very um, enlightening exegesis of Romans 1, 18 to 32, which centers on what he calls the perilous exchange that happens when God reveals the truth and we suppress and substitute that in our unrighteousness. Bavinck notes that the created order delivers true and objective knowledge of God, but that nature of, his, of this knowledge is not found through rational philosophical reflection, but is rather dynamic, personal, and relational in character. Second, Concerning this, the content of this revelation, Bavinck notes that when Paul talks about God's eternal power and divine nature, these pertain to our dependence and accountability of human beings to God. Especially this idea of divine nature is that we are, everyone is in a personal relationship with God. It designates us someone. Third, 
Bavinck moves on to mankind's subjective relation, reaction to this revelation. It penetrates people so that people know. I mean, this is the, this is the thing. I, um, I point this out in my book, Making Faith Magnetic. Imagine a, a, a huge game of hide-and-seek. Do you, do you know what hide-and-seek is the game? Yeah, you might call it something else. Um, in the world's version of hide-and-seek, God is the one who's, been, who's hiding, and we've looked for him. And we're rational people. We've looked for him everywhere. We can't find him. Yuri Gagarin went up to space, came back down, apparently said to the communist authorities, although we're not sure now, there's no one there. Is that how Romans says the game of hide-and-seek looks? No. God is not hiding. He has revealed himself in everything that he has made. We are the ones who are hiding. People know. They are addressed as knowers, says Bavinck. Although they knew God in Romans 1, says Bavinck, are words that Bartian theology will never give full due. People know. However, Bavinck immediately admits a paradoxical situation because the knowledge that condemns, for which we are responsible, also means that we don't know at the same time. We know and we don't know. The legal position is that of knowing, but their actual position is that of no, not knowing. They proceed as unknowing knowers as though they might possibly find him, as Paul says in Acts 17. Now, talking about this further, Bavinck focuses on the words in Romans 1 of suppression, catechine, and exchange, a lasso, metalasso, and employs terminology more associated with psychology. So he talks about almost rip, the repression of knowledge of God. Suppression carries with it the idea of violently holding something down. Literally, we try to drown the truth. We drown the truth as we're drowning someone. The sinner constantly suppresses general revelation is therefore without excuse. Bavinck notes that the idea might well be that this suppression occurs so directly so spontaneously, so simultaneously with the understanding that they no longer see and they no longer know. But it's penetrated. Suppression comes with substitution, what Bavinck calls a perilous exchange. Now look, the greatest theological minds have struggled with this. What are you saying? How do people know and don't know at the same time? How can we be running to God and running away from God at the same time? But that's the wonderful thing about God's revelation. It's not simplistic about human beings. We're messy people, anthropologically. Now, the best illustration that Bavinck uses is that of dreaming. He says, look, when you have a dream, what happens? Something that's occurred to you in the daytime is taken and it's distorted and twisted in all kinds of ways. You know, where I'm staying at the moment in the nice lodge house, there's a big grandfather clock and it ticks. But my dream was about a whole army of soldiers marching towards me. And Bavinck says that's how sin works. Revelation reveals reality. We take that, we suppress the truth, and we now make things that aren't real. It's a fantasy, but it's still based on truth. Brilliant way of defining what we do with the knowledge of God that we have. We twist and we, we distort. Why? Because the things that we make our gods out of, we would rather worship them than think about a living and true God to whom we are accountable. It's much easier to believe in fate because at the end of the day, fate doesn't care. It's impersonal. I can live my life. I still want some meaning. I still want to talk about fate and legitimacy. It can't be completely random. But that's why we like fate. Because it gives us some legitimacy, but not the personal responsibility. The theologies that people create, the false ideologies that people create, are ingenious ways of us evading an absolute and personal God. Now, what Bavinck does, and I develop this in my book, Making Faith Magnetic, again, I'll be talking about this more this evening, is that Bavinck says, the way that we suppress the truth and substitute it for other things, he says, there's a kind of a framework, like a morphology, I suppose you could call it. 
He says there appears to be a kind of framework within which human beings need to operate. There appear to be definite points of contact around which all ideas crystallize. There seems to be quite vague feelings. One might better call them direction signals that have been brooding everywhere. Perhaps this can be expressed thus. There seem to be definite magnetic points that time and again irresistibly compel human religious thought. Human beings cannot escape their power, but must provide an answer to those basic questions posed for them. So what Babbing says is all human beings, not just people in world religions, but all human beings, we suppress the truth, we substitute it for other things, but there's like a framework that can help us understand what's going on. He says they're these magnetic points, they're these itches that human beings have to scratch. They're not thinking about them consciously, but the way people live their lives, they're living out that religiosity. Since they are rooted in our existence, says Bavink, they are stronger than ourselves, and somehow we must come to grips with them. Even if they are never consciously articulated, human beings still answer them by their entire conduct and their attitude to life. Their whole way of living already implies an answer and is an answer. Friends, one thing I want you to understand, even in the Bible Belt of America, is that all human beings, secular, are religious. I've been saying to uh, uh, Dr. Daub this week, I want to get rid of the word religion. It's really unhelpful because it categorizes people into a certain category and it also presupposes the secular. That's not how the Bible sees human beings. Yeah? The most secular nun, N-O-N-E, is as religious in a certain sense as the person who's going to worship at the Kali temple. And we have to remember that. And that is one of the reasons why, in the way that your country is changing and shifting, and mine is as well, we have to have a cross-cultural attitude to all of our theological education and ministry. So Babbing talks about these five magnetic points. We can't really get into them now. I'll say a little bit more about them this evening. There's one about totality and the idea that we need identity and connectedness. There's one about the norm. We all have rules that we have. There's one about deliverance. All of us know that we need to be delivered from something, but we don't know what that is, or we all disagree on what that is. The fourth is about destiny. This is my favorite one. Bavink says that all human beings know that we both lead and undergo our lives. So, you know, most people, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they think, I can do it. I can do it. I've got freedom. I've got agency. I can change the world. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'm just a victim. I've got no choice. I'm just a puppet on a string. I'm in someone else's chess game. And then finally, the, the, the kind of the super magnetic point, I am the higher power. Who is the one? Is there one that connects us, that delivers us? And Baving says, all human beings are, these are the itches that we have to scratch in our lives, the choices that we make, our choice of family and entertainment, and the decisions we make, and our hopes and dreams and fears. And my work is, is often about, Baving is on the mission field in Indonesia, applying these magnetic points to Hinduism and Islam and Buddhism, and I'm saying, we need to apply them to your most secular American and Brit made in the image of God, suppressing the, the truth, but that religiosity has to come out somewhere. And again, in my work, I then say, having seen what the magnetic points are, we need to bring Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who subversively fulfills each one of those magnetic points. In Christ, we find true connection. In Christ, we find the true norm. In Christ, we find true deliverance. In Christ, we find our true destiny. We're not robots. We have accountability, and yet we believe one who is sovereign. In Christ, we have the true higher power. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, in uh, that book, Making Faith Magnetic, and my previous book, Plugged In, I do a little, um, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, help crib, I suppose, based on Acts 17, about how we do our cultural analysis. And I'd love you to go away and think about this based on Acts 17. 
enter into the world that we're, as Paul wanders around the objects of worship, you know, what are the objects of worship that we see around our area? Explore them. Where are the elements of grace, the good thing that's been idolized? How do we expose the idols? And how do we show off Jesus Christ as being the subversive fulfillment? Now we come back to this idea of elenctic. So with all that in mind, that's our theology of religions. Now we come back to elenctics. Elenctics concerns itself with the question to every human being, what have you done with God? And in more prosaic fashion, Bavinck lists the occurrences of the verb elengine in the New Testament. For those of you who are interested, uh, apart from one which he misses out, which I'm going to come back to at the end, uh, Jude 14 to 15, Revelation 3:19, John 16:8, 1 Timothy 5:20, and Matthew 18:15. These are all the occurrences of this elengine verb. Here's what Bavinck says, and really I'm going to base my comments on elenctics just on this passage to exegete this passage. From these texts, the, the, the occurrences of Elengaim in the New Testament, it is clear that the word in the New Testament is regularly translated as rebuking, but then in the sense that it includes the conviction of sin and a call to repentance. When we speak of elenctics, we do well to understand it in the sense that it has in John 16, 8. The Holy Spirit will convince the world of sin. The Holy Spirit is actually the only conceivable subject of the verb, for the conviction of sin exceeds all human ability. Only the Holy Spirit can do this, even though he can and will use us as instruments in his hand. Taken in this sense, elenctics is the science which is concerned with the conviction of sin. In a special sense, then, it is the science which unmasks all false religion and sin against God and calls people to the knowledge of the one true God. To be able to do this well and truthfully, it is necessary to have a responsible knowledge of false religions, but one must be able to lay bare the deepest motives which are therein expressed. This can actually occur only if one recognizes and unmasks these same undercurrents within himself. Elenctics is possible only on the basis of a veritable self-knowledge which is kindled in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, what I want to argue, again, remember, is how elenctics, the unmasking of sin, which the Holy Spirit does that we are told to do, the pastor, the church leader is told to do, how can that be the goal of convictional civility? So that's the, that's the puzzle I'm trying to solve. And I think there's three ways in which we do this. The first is this. Notice from that passage that we've just read. The Holy Spirit will convince the world of sin. Bavinck says the Holy Spirit is the subject and author of elenctics. He alone can call to repentance, and we are only a means in his hand. While we must work hard, our role is instrumental. In our apologetics and evangelism and unmasking, we are totally reliant on the Spirit's role in awakening an awareness of guilt and shame. And friends, this gives knowledge, gives us comfort, as Bavinck says, in the last instance, that results do not depend on our weak powers, but it is the Holy Spirit who would make us powerful in Christ. Second, Bavinck in that passage I read out talks about a responsible knowledge of false religions. Notice what he says about our study of other religions, study of any, any person. He talks about a scientific awareness and a lived approach. We note the necessity of a responsible knowledge of false religions. Elenctics requires professional expertise and personal relationship. As Bavinck says, elenctics must first all begin with a precise and calm knowledge of the nature of the religion with which it is concerned. It must do this honestly and calmly. That is to say, it must not be too quick to interrupt. It must listen to this religion state its case. 
In the very nature of the case, Elenctix makes thankful use of the data provided by the science of religion and the history of religion. So look, this is why it's civil, because if we are to unmask sin out of love, which I'll come on to, we have to do that in a way that really respects the other and listens. There's a scientific awareness which is so important. For that, I think we can talk about a partisan objectivity. We always look at the other from a theological point of view, but there can be a partisan objectivity. But also, with that, there needs to be a lived approach. A lived approach. It's not enough just to study the facts about other religions. We're dealing with people. Yes, we need to know about the five pillars of Islam. Yes, we need to know about the secular N-O-N-E, nun from San Francisco. But at the end of the day, we're dealing with people. This next quotation is probably the most quoted section of Introduction to the Science of Missions. Elenctics as the science of Elengai and the conviction of sin can actually be exercised only in living contact with the adherents of other religions. Each generalization, every systematization, carries within itself the danger that one will do injustice to the living person. In practice, I am never concerned with Buddhism, but with a living person and his or her Buddhism. I'm never in, con in contact with Islam, but with a, a, a Muslim and his Islam. Elenctics as a science, in other words, can never make superfluous the sensitive probings of the hidden depths of a person, a probing of his inner existence. Now, I think this is crucial in the way that we teach religion in seminaries. It's got to be scientific awareness and lived approach at the same time. Terry Muck, the uh, American scholar of religion, has written recently, religion must be increasingly seen as a dynamic quality of the human experience. People and cultures change the way they embrace and express their religions. To use a mathematical analogy, this means the introductory course in the religion um, will need to become more of a calculus capable of observing constantly changing dynamics than either an arithmetic, just the facts please, or an algebra, religion as symbol systems. I've had some good conversations with uh, uh, Dr. Daub about that this week. Finally, when it comes to elenctics, maybe the most important point for us today, I need to note Bavinck's quotation where he says, only if one recognizes and unmasks the same undercurrents within himself, elenctics is possible only on the basis of a veritable self-knowledge which is kindled in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? The unmasking of sin, idolatry and confrontation, and the call to repentance have never been winsome doctrines, but they are at the heart of a biblical theology of religions and a missionary task. We are calling people to repentance and faith in Christ. There is always a line of pain. However, with these vital doctrines and their applications, the temptations that we will always struggle with are what the New Testament call malice and vainglory, individually and tribally. Bavinck's writings, and I think his life, looking at his life, pour out that, that kind of phrase, gentle in our persuasion, powerful in substance. Bavinck calls this the warm undertone of meeting in love, the recognition of myself in the other person, a sympathetic feeling of his guilt, and a sincere desire in Christ to do with this man or woman what Christ has done with me. Bavinck says this, and it, look, if you don't follow anything else I've been saying, just listen to this, please. Elenctix receives the greatest support from its repeated awareness that the sharpest weapons must in the first place be turned against ourselves. 
Anyone who knows himself or herself to an extent knows the finesse by which we can escape from God and wrestle free from his grasp. To be really able to convict anyone in sin, a person must know themselves and the hidden corners of their heart very well. There is no more humbling work in the world than to engage in electics. For at each person, the person knows that the weapons with which he turns against another have wounded himself. The Holy Spirit convicts us, and then through us, he convicts the world. I'll say it at the end, and I'm going to say it again now. Our evangelism must flow from our discipleship. Okay, conclusion. The need for a civil electics. A civil electics. What's really interesting about the... the, the, the um, the occurrences that Bavink talks about with this verb elenctics is he probably doesn't use the instance which those of us in seminary, many of us training for Christian leadership, would go to first. Titus 1.9. It's a curious omission. For many years, and I presume paralleled in this seminary as well, an exposition of Titus 1, 5 to 9, is and can be, should be, the focal point in introducing students to the whys and wherefores of an evangelical theological education. The minister, the presbyter, is someone who has the word of God applied in their lives, in their lifestyle, in their thinking, and in their teaching. Refutation, elenctic, and rebuke are part of the minister's calling. The two voices, as Calvin put it, one for gathering the sheep and another for warding off and driving away wolves and thieves. The ethical qualifications required of an elder should be context enough to point to the manner of pastoral rebuke and refutation, one that is humble rather than arrogant. But arguably, there's an inbuilt civility in true refutation. Look, what is refutation? What does it mean to refute? It's not simply saying, I disagree with you, or giving a, a contradictory opinion. It's demonstrating where and how those who disagree with sound teaching actually do disagree with it. In fact, if we're doing refutation properly, and this is why you're here, you need to learn a number of skills. One, to know what is being said, to listen carefully to the other side. Two, to be able to compare that to real faith and sound teaching. We can't re rebuke false teaching if we don't know what real teaching is. Three, to see the difference between real teaching and false teaching and how the difference has arisen. Four, to know what really is a matter of indifference. We don't want to cause schism. Five, to persuasively, honestly, and lovingly demonstrate that to others. All in that little phrase in Titus 1.9, and refute others. That is a lifetime's work, friends. The aim is not just to say you're wrong or correct an intellectual misapprehension. The purpose of refutation is to bring the person back because we love them and believe what they're teaching is damaging their souls and others. Now, all of a sudden, that little phrase, and refute others, a link tick, becomes a complex and daunting task. Are we really able to listen to accounts of you are we able to describe without reverting to stereotype or caricature? Do I understand that what a person is saying so that if I repeated it back to them, they would say, yeah, that's what you're saying. And you might say, yeah, I do that already. Great. But if I get my phone out and click on the Twitter app or the Facebook app, I'm an old person, so I use Facebook, yeah, or any other app, and we look at the discourse, I don't see much of this going on at the moment. I don't think you see much of this going on, even within your own denomination. A civil listening is not only enshrined in the common law principle of listen to the other side, but is surely an implication of Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself, to do to others what you would have them do to you, and to love your enemies. Now, in this regard, I've, as I've led discussions at uh, uh, the seminary where I was teaching and now at Crosslands, two pieces that I've, I would say to you I found really helpful. And the first is by the great um, Reformed Baptist, Roger Nicole. 
I was talking to Dr. Aiken about um, Dr. Nicole uh, uh, earlier. A little paper he wrote called Dealing with Difference, where he encourages us to ask three questions when faced with difference. First, what do I owe to the person who differs from me? We have obligations to people who differ from us. We want to know what people are saying. We want to understand what they mean. Second, what can I learn from those who differ from me? I may be, I may be wrong. I may be failing to embody the truth in its entirety. Finally, how can I cope with those who are different from me? Are we attempting to win an argument in order to manifest our own superior knowledge and debating ability, or are we seeking to win another person who we perceive as enmeshed in error or inadequacy by exposing him to the truth and light that God has given to us? A Christian, in carrying on discussions with those who differ, should not be subject to the psychology of the boxing ring where the contestants are bent upon demolishing each other. Rather, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance. Please look out for that essay, Dealing with Difference. Faculty, study it with your tutor groups. Faculty, look at it amongst yourselves. A very helpful piece. Secondly, this is an unpublished paper that you can only find in this lecture. Um, the late Reformed Baptist pastor, Robert Sheehan, did a very, I think, quite provocative paper called Dealing with False Teaching um, at the British Evangelical Council in the 1970s and 80s. He says, look, the reasons why churches and individuals become ensnared in error are varied. The apostolic approach to error was not simplistic, enabling us to set out slick formula and rules of thumb. The apostolic approach to error was complex because it took all error seriously, but also took into account the nature of the error and the reasons why error had arisen. The apostles recognized that not everyone who is in error is in a state of open rebellion against the truth. Not everyone in error is seeking to pervert the gospel and overthrow the faith. Other factors have to be taken into consideration when assessing why error occurs in any particular situation. Now, he actually has a typology of one, two, three, four, five different types of error that we see in the New Testament. They're all wrong, but they're all dealt with differently. Apollos in Acts 18, 20 to 24. He's eloquent, competent in the scriptures, and instructed in the way of the Lord. Luke says he taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, but there was something miss missing. And when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they explained to him the way of God more accurately. Notice they didn't say, go and emasculate yourself. They put their arm around the shoulder. Apollos was in error, but not denounced for it. He was teachable, and this led into further usefulness in ministry. Then there are the sincere misinterpreters. Some people don't want to be in error, but they've misunderstood the teachings of Scripture. She cites 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11 as an example of this. Paul has to remove misunderstanding for further clarification with the Corinthians. Third, they're the temporarily inconsistent. This is why Peter at Antioch, whom Paul had to oppose... Peter was not regarded as unregenerate, but his conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Fourth, there are the deceived, the foolish Galatians. And fifth, there are the deceivers. These people are enemies of the gospel who are fundamentally unwilling to be submissive to the apostles. Sheehan notes that there's a great deal of discernment that's required in these situations but only there are two types of errorists. There are those who are in submission to the apostles, yet for some reason are not doing what the apostles have said. And there are those who are not in submission to the apostles, those who are biblically submissive, yet in error, and those who are biblically subversive, and therefore in error. There is a difference. We just think error is error, and we either don't deal with it seriously enough, or we overreact. The New Testament has a variegated way of dealing with error. Conclusion. In this first page lecture, I've been arguing for a convictional civility, which I believe can be achieved as we reconsider and revitalize 
the discipline of electics in our seminaries and our churches. I focused in this first lecture on the need for a civil electics. In my second lecture this evening, which will be more outward focused, I will argue for the need and a, for an electic civility. Let me finish with this. In 1 John chapter 5, we are exhorted to keep ourselves from idols. In recent years, and because of the increasingly post-Christian and pagan culture in which I administer and teach, both myself and my students have realized that elenctics is not simply an outward focus on the other, but also an inward focus on ourselves and our Christian spirituality, discipleship, and formation that must be reflected in our seminaries at all levels, students, faculty, administration. Moreover, for those going out into pastoral ministry of any kind, it is elenctics that will be needed for our dis discipling and catechizing of believers under our pastoral care, stressing that their witness and evangelism will be most effective when it flows from their discipleship. How do our gatherings and means of grace keep us magnetized by Jesus and not pulled away by the magnetic power of sin, pious self-excitement and religious inventiveness? The worship of God, the nurturing of the believer, and the evangelization of the unbeliever are not three missions which battle for supremacy, but are all part of one mission, where each element reinforces the other and is weakened without the other. May this be true of our churches, our seminaries, and all Christian disciples as we go and make disciples. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and... Uh, we especially, Lord, thank you for the way that you have given uh, the qualifications for elders and church leaders and those in any kind of leadership responsibility for Christian disciples, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, when we have displayed malice and vainglory towards the other. Lord, we recognize the need for the uncovering of sin, for the unmasking of idolatry. It's so essential and yet, Lord, we also know that we need to apply the weapons that we use on others to ourselves first. We pray, Lord, that we would be those who know that our evangelism and witness springs from our discipleship. Lord, that we would long to be magnetized by staying close to you by the means of grace. Lord, help us to be a people who are civil and also convictional. Lord, we uh, see instability and incivility all around us. May we be those who can bring some light in what is often a very dark world. Amen.